be doing something in Zoom. Um, Gavin, say hello. Hello, everyone. I'm Gavin. I was just setting up the recording. Our first presenter today will be Yue Zhou with Reveal the Mystery of Age Degradation. All right. All right. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. My name is Yue. I'm very excited to be the first presenter here today. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you a story about why I want to understand paint degradation. So first, let's click on the slide so you can work on it. Let's click on the slide so you can work. There we go. All right, thank you. All right, the first page probably just want to get a surprise before it comes. So I would invite you to enjoy this masterpiece from Pablo Picasso at first. So this is an image of the fan taken in recent years. And if we compare the colors of the with those from 50 years ago, you'll probably see some differences from those two paintings. So it is actually the same painting, but you probably see the color difference on the upper left corner and the region below the figure of the body. So the yellow color actually faded over time a lot. So this yellow pigment, which is called cadmium yellow, was a group of very famous inorganic pigments in 19th to 20th century. And they had, where is it? They had beautiful colors and vivid hues. So they have been loved by a lot of famous artists, including Pablo Picasso, including Vincent van Hall, and Claude Monet, and Evermore. At that time, people thought these manufactured pigments wouldn't degrade. However, over decades, people figured out that degradation did happen in most of the paintings with cadmium yellow. And there are variations in degradation behaviors. In some paintings, like this one, the color faded, but in some other paintings, the color darkened, and there were chalking, flaking, and even forming of whitish globules on the surface of the painting. So this caused a lot of problems for our conservators and researchers because they would like to know what happened and how to preserve this paintings better in the future. And this lead to the topic I want to talk about today is how do we understand what happened during paint And before diving into more details, I want to reemphasize why we want to understand this important question. So the first purpose I already talked a little bit about it is for conservation because we want to avoid further degradation and we want to know what happened, what is the mechanism for degradation and what factors influence it, including humidity, the light, or the gaseous pollutant from the atmosphere, or the quality of pigment themselves. Besides this, we can actually restore some damaged regions if we know what actually happened, or we probably compensate for some missing portion of the paint. And the third purpose could be obtain an objective description of artists for working. For example, we can know what specific type of cadmium yellow has been used and whether the pigment has been mixed with other pigments. And during this period, we can also know whether the paint is authentic or not. So this is why we want to know it. it's a very significant problem. And to achieve the goal, the technique I use is called compound microscopy. So it is a laser scanning microscopy, which has been used a lot in biological imaging and material science imaging. But 
and partly used in cultural heritage science. This technique has a pretty non-destructive uh, ability, which means if we carefully control the power of the laser, it's not going to hurt the paintings. We don't have to take real cross sections from the paint and hurt the paint either further. And it has high resolution, which means even though there could be small portion of components, we can still see submicron regions on the paint. Besides that, it has high chemical specificity, which means the components of the paint can be obtained during this process. So it can fingerprint different components, including the pigments, the binders, the additives added by the artist, or some other pollutants or degradation products. Besides that, it has three dimensional images, which means um, we are not only looking at the surface of the painting, but we can penetrate through the surface and look at deeper layers. So I designed some, so I obtained some um, artificially degraded cam cadmium sulfide by synthesized cadmium sulfide pigment through historical, historical recipes, and then carefully designed the degradation conditions to make some degraded paints, and then monitor what happened during this period with this high um, resolution technique. So all of the info I obtained in this research will help me, help me know what are the important factors that influence the degradation and to provide further information for our conservators about what is a proper environment to preserve the painting and make it uh, visible for more people in the future. It is a very important uh, problem for most of the museums in the world. So this is the research I devoted myself to during my PhD at Duke. With that, I'm happy to take any questions. How do you, you say you have an artificial aging laser? You saw aging. What physical changes do you make to age the paint? Uh, I change the a level of light, I change the relative humidity of the chamber, and I control what are the components of the paint. For example, I can use pure paint, I can, I can manually add some. Is that in residues? I can control what the, the ratio between the pigment and binder. So a lot of relative factors can be used. So that is an aging process. Thank you. Up next, we have Rachel Ansley. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, my name is Rachel Ansley, and I'm a first year Master's of International Development Policy student here at Duke. So I'm going to start today with a little visualization. So take a moment to think about the people who operate in this type of space. So now let's think about the people who operate in this type of space. Generally speaking, we're talking about children and the ways in which they may move this space to this one. If you'd like to think that there's no connection between these two spaces, but that may not always be the case. Today, I'm going to be talking about the connections between classrooms and conflict zones and the consequences of those connections for peace building and conflict transformation work. When we think of conflict, we often think in terms of geopolitical movements, social groups, or national motivations. But what if we thought in terms of individuals? The choice to pursue conflict isn't, isn't one that originates in the mind of an individual, and it is individuals who make up the warring sides in a conflict. But thinking about conflict in terms of the individuals involved poses a series of questions. Who are they? What do they want? And how did they arrive at this point? But I would propose another important question. Who were they as children? When thinking about somebody responsible for, for violence or a violent actor, it can be difficult to imagine that that person was once a child. Can you picture Putin in a kindergarten classroom? 
by, by taking the typical assessment of a combatant and casting a light backward into their past, we can examine not only who they are, but how they became who they are. <clears throat> My research has focused on the connections between the behavior of children and adults, and the ways in which adult decisions are informed by lessons learned as children. A key conclusion is that children who learn conflict management strategies at a young age are less likely to grow into adults who resort to violence. With this idea in mind, I've identified a series of core competencies and behaviors that we often teach to children at a young age and the ways in which adults do or do not manifest these behaviors in a conflict setting. What I found is that the gap between the behavior patterns of children and adults may not be quite as wide as we like to believe. So let's look at a few examples. The first is rooted in a core theory of the individual causes for war, that is the frustration aggression theory. Essentially what this tells us is that when people feel frustrated or unable to attain their goals, they may act out in aggressive ways. This can explain why somebody might resort to violence, but to me, it also sounds a little bit like a temper tantrum. Another example is the idea of impulse control. When we teach this to children, we use words like, take a deep breath, count to 10, think before you speak. Now, if we think about the summer of 2017 and the posturing on the world stage between the United States and North Korea and threats of nuclear war, I'd be willing to bet that impulse control is not their strongest attribute. Another example is compromise. For anyone who has siblings, you understand that compromise is a core conflict management strategy. And it's worked out quite well for the world leaders who can manage it. For context, this is the finding of a peace deal in Colombia. There are so many more examples, but the key question here is that if this connection exists in the way that I've proposed, what can we do about it? And this is where I see the value of child development interventions, specifically those related to social emotional learning. But what is social emotional learning? Has anyone ever been in a classroom where a teacher has taught you to empathize, apologize, or be kind? That is social emotional learning. But how can this connect to the world of conflict transformation and peace building? Most conflict resolution efforts focus on working with adults who have set patterns of decision making and behavior. And this can make it much more difficult to find a solution. But what if we focused on resolving conflict before conflict had even taken place? By working with children and teaching them the core competencies needed for conflict management in their own lives, peace builders and educators can form interventions that may help prevent conflict before it's ever escalated beyond the classroom. We can also think about this in terms of the cycle of conflict. When we think of conflict in a linear fashion, it's something that has a beginning, a middle and an end or cause, conflict and resolution. Now with this model, education-based interventions are most effective at the end after a conflict has taken place and can contribute to peace building and resolution efforts. But if we think of conflict in terms of a cycle with generational implications and long-term patterns, an education-based intervention that helps to resolve one conflict can simultaneously work to prevent the next. I don't claim that there is a direct correlation between social emotional learning and peaceful societies. There are too many considerations of culture and too many different parameters of diversity to make this claim. But there are a few things that are clear. What we know is that when we give children the tools they need to grow with the lessons they learn, they become powerful instigators for change. By working with children, peace builders and educators can work together to identify innovative solutions and approaches to conflict resolution and ultimately develop long-term pathways to peace. Thank you. Up next, we have Human Bharati Seda.
All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Humal Barati, and today I want to talk about how singular optics can benefit nanoprotons. All right. Uh, it all starts with the, uh, the notion of a vortex. So if I ask you what a vortex is, in a very general term, you can say that it's nothing but a circulating disturbance of some sort of sub, right? And uh, it's an interesting phenomena that uh, nature can also have a various form of that. For example, it starts from the galaxies to black holes to whirlpool or even a tornado. All they have in common is nothing but a, a vortex like behavior. Uh, more interestingly, light can also behave the same. Uh, just as like the Earth orbiting around the sun and also spinning around its axis. Light can also behave the same. These two phenomena, we call them as spin angular momentum and orbital angular momentum. But what is different here is that we can basically change this orbital angular moment on demand. That's with a number, an integer number that we call it OAM mode or topology contract. The question that might be raised is that, okay, so why is it useful for us? Uh, it turns out that uh, you can basically encode information between all these uh, modes so that once you send the information, they will not interfere with one another. And as a result, we can increase the channel capacity. This uh, technology is known as a multiplexing order. So here I just show a video. Uh, let's say we have three modes. The blue one is OEM mode one. The gray one is OEM mode two. And the red one is OEM mode three. You can have more than that, but for now, let's say we have just three. And then I will start to encode information between all of these modes. It turns out that these modes will not interfere with one another while they are propagating. And as a result, at the end, we can decode these information uh, simply. This technology is known as demultiplexing. Now, if I take all these modes and then use different frequencies, then we know that the three different frequencies will not interfere with each other. So as a result, I can use more data. More data means uh, you can uh, use uh, uh, different information for uh, different purposes. However, the question is that, how can we make all these things small? So if I ask you to think of the, the smallest feature size that you can imagine, you can probably tell me that it's nothing but like around a millimeter size. However, uh, with the current technology, we can uh, fabricate stuff in the range of nanometer. So if I tell you what a nanometer is, uh, if you're from a science uh, background, you kind of have the idea from like the numbers, but uh, do you really know the intuition of how small a nanometer is? So this is the picture I took from a mosquito. I honestly don't know the type of mosquito, maybe the biological guys know about it. And this is the, uh, the hair that are uh, on the mosquito's body, right? And uh, this, uh, this picture, by the way, are taken not from the optical microscope, it's from uh, electron microscope. And if you try to measure the V of this hair, it turns out to be around 700 nanometer. However, with the current technology, we are able to make things which is uh, around 10 nanometer to 100 nanometer. These scales is known, um, and like making stuff that can interact with light is known as nanoproton. So here are just a couple of examples we are doing here at Duke. So you can see that we can uh, build a cube that the dimension is around 262 nanometer. So just compared with the hair on a mosquito's body, it's like uh, almost uh, more than half of it is smaller than that. And by engineering all these uh, cubes, we can make them in a periodic fashion that we call them as a meta surface, by the way means beyond like a regular surface. And then we can make these stuff, these vortex beam at nanoscale. So you can see that it's like five micrometer in total size. You might ask, okay, we have the smallest size, but like how small? This is just a regular type device that we use to make a vortex beam or OAMBs. It's called as a spatial light modulator, super big, and it's around 30,000 uh, K. Uh, with the technology of metasurface, we can build things in this scale. And that can also provide you with uh, those moments, those uh, OEM moments. So you can use this. Imagine that you have this stuff within your uh, phone or whatever device that you have, and that can also lead to more data transmission. So you can imagine the world that was like uh, very fast with lots of data transmission, but very small. So you don't really need to uh, occupy a lot of uh, space on that. 
Uh, with that, I would like to uh, thank my group members and I would be happy to take any question. Next, we have Chiray Ju. Hi, everyone. My name is Chiray. I'm <laughs> from the Econ Department. I'm a second year law student. The topic I want to cover today is about getting promotion in Chinese economics academia. So here's the research overview. The purpose for this research is to understand that what are potential impacts for the chance of faculty members getting promoted in top Chinese economics departments. The data sources I have collected it comes from the top 20 Chinese economics departments. I have scraped over um, around 4,000 data, and among those, I try to use NLP, which is natural language processing, to try to parse the data and clean the data. And I also use facial recognition technique to try to identify faculty's uh, gender based on their images so that I can have the, all of the information I needed for further research. And there are three dimensions of scope I mainly look at. The first one is gender. and I found that men, males are more likely to get promoted. And the second one is international experience. International PhD degree holders have also held promotion and a third one is a political affiliation. Uh, being affiliated to the Communist Party are more likely to be promoted. Um, here are the details. As you can see that being a male compared to women, men uh, have like around 6.5, uh, 6, 6 6.5 probability to getting promoted. And for the international degree, this number is 6.9%. And for being a party affiliation, this number is 5.92%. All of those numbers are significant in my data. So this suggests that there are potential gaps in, in terms of gender, international experience, and also political affiliation within those uh, top Chinese economics department. So I'm looking for like a potential explanation. I mean, this part, I'm still working on it. And then for the gender, uh, there are lots of research going on regarding the Western countries about why, uh, why the male faculty member receive more promotion compared to female. But I guess there is, I just could not find anything regarding to the Chinese economics department. But I found, I guess, yeah, those kind of research did not exist prior to mine. So, I am looking for a potential explanation. One theory I could potentially borrow from the Western setup is that um, there could be a stereotypes in among Chinese uh, economic, economic departments that kind of blocking women to get the promotion. And also for the, for the political affiliation, I think this relates to the leadership structure within schools. All of the Chinese schools are I mean, nearly almost most of the significant one at least are public schools. So government has a potential control in those schools. So they have the tendency to choose those people which have the same ideology aligned with their goal. That's why those people get are more likely to get promoted. And also for the foreign education, this part is tricky because in our Western setup, there's, there are not many research that cover this topic. Um, so I kind of want to construct my own idea. I saw that compared to uh, people who do not get their degree outside of mainland China, having a foreign education experience will at least uh, it allows them to know something other people do not know. So those kind of extra knowledge is, that's not been measured in my data set, that could be a potential advantage for them to get promotion. And yeah, I also want to show some of my other findings. As you can see that only 26% of people in my data set received international degree and about 17.5% of people have party membership. And uh, only, and it's basically a male dominant field. 
so over 76% of faculty members are male instead of female. And yeah, those are the gap across schools. I construct the four category based on the overall rankings of schools. As you can see that I selected the top schools, elite schools, selective schools, and normal schools. Based on the gender panel, I found that the top school, the gender gap is largest compared to the normal schools. And also similar thing happened for international degree as well as uh, party affiliation. I guess for, for international degree, top schools in China have most have high, could high, have the ability to hire many faculty members with international degree, but for normal school, which is ranked 50 to 100, they don't have that capacity to do so. And also for party affiliation, a strange thing I found is that for the top schools in China actually have lower percentage of people having a political affiliation compared to normal schools. And you can see that. I think one potential explanation for this is because the, there's a share between like obligation and uh, again, like benefit cost, benefit and cost. So for faculty member and top school, they have just met better choice instead of just joining in, in the party and also having their political obligation binding on them. So that's why they tend not to join the party system compared to people in the normal school. But that's our working theory. I, it's not conclusive. So yeah, hope I can find out in the future. And also I want to share with you, these are the fields, the sub fields in econ. As you can see the macro, which relate to the uh, national development, kind of the most popular about all of those fields. And uh, the second most popular field is financial economics. And the third one is business income. So yeah, um, this field is just trying to illustrate that what are, what are, are those faculty members working on in within those top 20 Chinese economics department. I think that's all I want to share with you. Thank you. Well, what was the, uh, on the party, what were the main parties that you? Oh, it's the Communist Party. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. Do you know if the number of years spent at the gate out of China? Oh, most of people got their PhD degree. Yeah, it's basically a PhD. Yeah. No, 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 no bachelor. Yeah, it's just a PhD degree. Yeah. yeah. Control for what? Ability. Like, is it like people who are going abroad are higher? Um, are more able than people who are not going to abroad and like they're better way to establish that. Yeah, I think I consider the very best multi dimensional. So I have their like uh, award records and also publication records and also the book they publish. I mean, and also the H index number. So I have, yeah, I forgot to mention, I connect to the API for like a public publisher and then try to match their names with their H index as well as total number of papers they publish. So those are also the controls I include in my regression. So yeah, sorry, I didn't show you, but yeah, if you're interested, you feel free to contact me. Up next, we have Jameson Bloom. In 1962, geneticist Dr. James Mueller uh, proposed a pretty controversial hypothesis in the field of population genetics. Now, Dr. Neal who's an MD-PhD working from the University of Michigan, 
up to this point had already established, been the first to establish a genetic basis for sickle cell anemia and initiated a longitudinal study that examined the genetic defects among survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So he was in a good position to speak on this matter. And um, his hypothesis, known as the thrifty gene hypothesis, um, suggests that some populations, particularly those that have undergone some food scarcity and famine during, throughout their history, uh, have evolved to more efficiently store and utilize energy. So during times of famine, this would uh, give them a survival advantage. But in today's modern environment where food is plentiful, um, instead results in conditions like obesity, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. So given that um, metabolism is a pretty complex process in humans, it may be hard to imagine that this thing has any relevancy to that question. But this thing, um, a nematode roundworm named C. canorhabditis elegans, or C. elegans, is a fantastic model organism for studying a question like this. Uh, as you'll notice from this picture, it is uh, transparent under a microscope. So any modifications that we make to its genome, we can observe at the single cell level. In addition, these experiments are made easier by the fact that their genomes are a lot shorter and better understood than our genomes. Additionally, if you will, yeah, there is. Um, you'll notice these small little ovals in their bodies. Those are all self-fertilized eggs. So most C. elegans are hermaphrodites in the wild, which means that they produce their own sperm and their own eggs. So there's no need to make sure that they made in captivity or anything. Um, they can just produce their own progeny. Uh, and in addition, C. elegans have a really tight life cycle. Under stable conditions, uh, three days is all they need to go from being hatched to a full-grown adult. And um, this is great if we want to study how our genetic modifications uh, change over generations. We can get several generations over a week. Um, alternatively, and a really interesting part about their response to starvation and their starvation resistance um, is what's known as their, their developmental rest periods. And to, it plays a major role, as you'll see, in their development. So first of all, when they're larvae and they detect in their environment that there's a lot of crowding going on, there's not a lot of food, um, high temperature, they can arrest their development, molt into an alternative form called the dower, uh, which has heightened stress resistance. Um, so I spoke earlier, three days is a normal life cycle. While they're in a dower, they can survive up to four months without food, without reproduction. Um, they essentially remain ageless in the state. They can also arrest development even sooner than that if they hatch without any food in their environment. And this confers a similar resistance to stress, and they can survive equally long in this period. Additionally, every pin you see here is a wild strain that has been farmed, or that has been discovered in the wild. A person went out and discovered these little worms, um, usually on sitting on uh, rotting vegetable matter. That's her favorite snack. Um, so there's a lot of natural variation in how they resist starvation, as you can see. And so what a lot of my research is, is geared towards is using this to identify maybe a genetic region, to identify one of these strains that is particularly good at resisting starvation and trying to understand the genetics behind that trait. Now, in humans, when we want to identify uh, a genetic region associated with the trait, we do something called a, genome, a genome-wide association study, or GWAS. So we take people with and without a trait of interest. Uh, we get a genetic sample from them. And from that sample, we identify which individuals carry certain genetic markers. And then using statistics, we associate those given genetic markers with the trait of interest. And this is a Manhattan plot. You'll notice it looks a lot like the Manhattan skyline. Um, and that green region here is a region that, for example, may be associated with a given trait of interest. And again, using statistics, we can do what's called fine mapping and zoom in on this region to identify the most likely causal marker for that trait of interest. And so this is a lot, this is where my work is a lot of the time. And I'm hoping to adapt these tools because to apply these tools to see how it gets a little complicated. Because these tools were originally, were originally built for humans. So to adapt these tools and use their unique biology to learn more about our, our own physiology is really the big question um, of focus. So thank you. Any questions? Yes. I don't know if there is in the genetic analysis or 
Yeah, we do that all the time. Um, and if we were to do this with any other one organism, it'd be not great because usually what we have to do is we have to bleach them um, to get at the eggs and we synchronize their development. What's known as a pretty standard survival assay. And we identify which strains, um, it's sort of like a pool of, of worms. And in that pool, there are many different strains. And so we monitor the frequency of each strain over time, whatever strain is you know, the winner at the end. Um, that's the one that we identify. We get those samples, we identify the SNPs from, or the markers that are responsible for that um, survival advantage. Thank you. Um, so did you know one in six girls um, around the world um, give birth before the age of 18? And that around 374 million new cases of STIs, which are sexually transmitted infections, are reported each year and highest rates are among adolescents. Um, hello everyone, I'm Pooja. I am second year master's in global health and I'll be talking about the sexual and about reproductive health among young girls in five or middle income countries. And we're talking about this because it's a major health issue among young people. Issues such as early pregnancy and STIs, which are sexually transmitted infections, uh, cause numerous health issues, which can be life-threatening, disabling, and cause um, opportunity costs, which means it can prevent you from going to school, work, which can cause you um, um, which can prevent um, you from participating in further uh, opportunities that can worsen the cycle of poverty and cause more health outcomes, negative health outcomes. As you can see, it's the maternal health conditions um, is top second cause of death among girls 15 to 19. Um, the rates of death among adolescents girls due to AIDS is almost 16 times. Um, these numbers get worse um, for those in low and middle income countries. Um, those who are socially and economically marginalized may not have the education or resources to face these issues. Um, but also there might be sexual activity that can happen in context of coercion, violence, and transactional sex, which um, gets them into a more risky situation. Um, as you can see, oh, sorry. The numbers are pretty high, 21 million adults in pregnancies to refer those in LMICs, which are low and middle income countries, of which 7.3 million turn into birth, um, compared to 1.6 global numbers for adults in birth, uh, low and middle income countries, uh, one in four adults in girls here birth before the age of. In my study, I focused a little bit more on orphan children because um, they, uh, with their parental absence are um, shown to have higher um, risk of being exposed to abuse, exploitations, and experiencing trauma, all of which are associated with further negative health outcomes. Um, that's an issue because there are very few literature out there which focuses on their specific needs for sexual and reproductive trauma. Sure. And, um, that's an issue because there are many of them and the number continues to grow. Um, as you can see, HIV AIDS, which is already a sexual health outcome, is causing a lot of children to lose their parents. And if not a 
best it can continue to worsen the problem. So I focused on orphans. Um, I did a study um, with a cohort of 933 young girls um, across these countries. And I uh, and my, study, my cohort included those who were non-orphans and orphans in residential care settings and um, family-based care settings. And I did my study to kind of understand the prevalence of uh, early pregnancies and those, among those who were sexually active, I wanted to see their behavior using condoms. Uh, I used condom use because among um, birth control measures, it also protects you from STIs. So um, I also wanted to see what factors were most uh, significantly associated. So I used some um, age, um, care setting, countries, education, um, to kind of see what, what factors were really associated with having early pregnancy in condom. Um, so this is what I found. Most of the people in my group were not married, had not worked, and most of them had a history of abuse. Um, among those who had gone to school uh, for secondary higher education, interestingly, more orphans from residential care had um, received some kind of sort of secondary education compared to others. And that you can see compared to non-orphans, orphans had higher history, higher rates of history of abuse, but um, it was specifically higher among those who were based in residential based care. And when I say residential based care, those are people who were in orphanages or institutions. Um, work status is um, when they had to work for income. So these young kids, uh, as you can see, the non-orphans were the ones who didn't have to work as much. No. Um, with pregnancy, we saw lucky only 4% of the cohort uh, was at early pregnancy. And compared to, um, Oh, sorry. Um, interestingly, I had a hypothesis that the non orphans would have their lowest rates of early pregnancy, but um, residential orphans have the lowest rate of early pregnancy. Um, <clears throat> sorry, the computer is not working. <laughs> Thank you so much. And for the condoms, uh, thankfully, a lot of people were using condom, but not significantly a lot um, compared to other pregnancy. Um, non orphan were the ones who were most likely to use condom, and resident orphans were the least likely to use. And among the factors that I've mentioned earlier, these were the findings I found. Uh, so, age. Uh, history of abuse and having to work for income were positively associated with early pregnancy, which means that having to, the higher the age, the more odds of getting into sexual activity and having early pregnancy, which might sound contradicting, but in my study, anyone who was younger than 18 was um, considered early pregnant. Um, being a non-orphan, that means having parents, uh, having secondary education, and being single were some of the factors that lowered your odds of early pregnancy, uh, according to my study. Um, um, those were individual association that I did, but all together when you, because this is a complex issue and all these factors work together. Um, when I did a multiple regression, I found that others were not, history of abuse was not as significant, um, but these were. So being single and secondary education were still a significant factor and reduced the odds of early pregnancy um, while working, having to work for income increased yours. Um, also pregnancy. There were, uh, I did the same analysis for the condom use and found that most of them were not significantly associated. We couldn't, um, draw conclusions for the few, sm the small sample I had. Um, so the only thing I could found was that um, being single um, meant that you 
would have lower, um, sorry, higher use of condom. I also found that family-based care uh, for those who were less likely to use condom, and these were some protective factors, but they were not significantly associated, so they're not in my results section. So what does this mean? I'm sorry for the detailed um, findings, but um, we found that family-based orphans who are within the family have the odds of higher early pregnancy. And those in residential risk care were likely to not use condom while engaging in sexual activity. And that non orphans had lower odds of early pregnancy and higher odds of using condom. And these were some of the protective factors um, secondary education and being single while working for income was seen as a um, factor that increased your risk of early pregnancy. Um, obviously, my study had some limitations. These are still uh, some stigmatized topics and sensitive topics that people don't want to talk about. Um, and there are some assumptions um, with condom use. But given all that I've shared with you so far, what does that mean? Uh, I would also, being a researcher myself, would say there's a lot more to research out here. Um, obviously, my study didn't include people who were younger than 15, so I cannot speak for everyone when I'm saying talking about early pregnancy. Um, condom use, um, the question we'd ask was, have you ever used condom? So it doesn't really measure the ones, um, their current use of condom. Uh, so it was not the best measure that I could have used. Um, it didn't include street orphans who might be at the high, higher risk and does not represent anyone, um, including in this study. Um, all I can say is the interventions that are going on now can encourage education as it has significantly protective um, um, results for these outcomes that I talk about, about early pregnancy, and that these interventions would um, Consider using care setting specific, um, uh, could be, uh, sorry, tailored to the care uh, settings so that it can be more beneficial um, when it's targeted. I want to acknowledge the team members that uh, helped me in this research. Um, thank you for listening. And if anyone has any questions, please. So, up next, we have Elise Labuliko. Up next, we have Elise Labuliko. Uh, so, hello everyone. My name is Elise. I'm a uh, sorry, yeah. um, I'm a uh, fifth year student, um, PhD student in the physics department. And today I'm going to talk about uh, the building blocks of matter, uh, what we know and what we don't know. So, uh, what do we really mean by building blocks? Uh, so, let's talk a bit about scales. So, if you look at the Earth, um, it has a scale of 10 to the power 7 meters in diameter. Uh, if you zoom in about uh, 100 million times, you get about the size of an apple. If you do the same thing, uh, you get the size of a molecule. So you have your apple that's made up of a bunch of molecules. Um, if you zoom in some more, this time only a factor of 10, you get to the size of an atom. So the, the atoms are what constitute the molecules. And then you can zoom in even more to the nucleus of the atom. And inside the nucleus of the atom, we, we have protons and neutrons. And inside that proton, we have uh, quarks and gluons. And the quarks and gluons inside the proton are what we are interested in. 
So these are really the smallest and most fundamental constituents of matter that we know of currently. So this is what we're studying. So uh, what do we know at this point? We have a theory that's called a standard model of particle physics, and it uh, classifies all the known fundamental particles uh, based on their properties. Um, so we, we've already talked about the quarks. Um, so those are the ones that uh, are found inside of the, the protons and neutrons that are in the uh, nuclei of the atoms. Um, so we have the more um, common ones like the up and down quarks that are inside the proton. And we also have some uh, more rare ones like the top and bottom quarks. Um, okay, so then we have uh, another familiar one, which is the electron. Uh, the electron is uh, what makes electricity, uh, but it, it's also uh, what um, orbits around the nucleus of the atom. Uh, the heavy cousin of the electron is the muon, and muons are found mostly in um, cosmic rays. So there, we actually have um, these showers of particles that are coming from outer space that are hitting the Earth constantly, and those are mostly made up of muons. Um, so then we have uh, the bosons, which are the particles that are responsible for carrying the fundamental forces. Um, so, for example, the W and Z bosons, they carry the nuclear force. So they are what they're responsible for, for example, nuclear uh, decay. The photon is the particle that carries uh, the electromagnetic force. So it's the particle of light. Um, so a laser uh, it can be thought of as a collection of photons. And then finally, we have the Higgs boson. Um, and this is the, the particle that's responsible for mass. Without the Higgs boson, none of these other particles would have mass. Um, and it's the only boson, it's the only particle that's named after a person. Um, Peter Higgs was the, the person who postulated the existence of the Higgs boson uh, back in the 60s. And this was uh, finally discovered at uh, CERN in 2012. And this is uh, a picture of Peter Higgs and uh, Francois Anglais, who also uh, was working with him at the time. And they uh, were there at the, uh, the announcement of the discovery of the Higgs boson. OK, so how do we know all this? Well, um, one way that we uh, learn about fundamental particles is through um, hadron colliders. So the, the biggest one is the Large Hadron Collider uh, that is located near Geneva. Uh, so it's at the border between France and Switzerland. Um, and you can see here uh, kind of an aerial view of the, uh, the region. And this circle here is uh, where the, the accelerator is located. So it's, uh, it's a particle accelerator that is 17 miles in circumference. Uh, and it's located 330 feet underground. And it, it takes protons and accelerates them basically at the speed of light. And then it collides them uh, about 1 billion times per second. OK, so what happens when the protons collide? Well, we have two protons. Um, as we saw before, uh, they're uh, made up of two up quarks and a down quark. And when they collide, basically, their energy is converted to the mass of new particles. So for example, we can have uh, some of these really rare particles come out, like top quarks or Higgs bosons. So we're actually creating uh, new particles in these collisions. How do we know what comes out of the collision? How can we detect that? Well, we have um, these massive detectors that are placed around the collision points that measure what comes out. So this is one of the detectors at uh, the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, it's called the Atlas detector. This is the one that I work on. Um, and so it's, uh, it's very large. It's uh, 82 feet high and 150 feet long. Um, and some parts of it have a temperature that goes down to about uh, negative 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so it's a, it's a very, uh, very big, very technologically complex um, detector. But with it, we're able to measure uh, the products of the collision and kind of reconstruct what happened in that collision. So. Um, that's great. We have a way to study, and uh, we came up with this uh, model of particle physics, but there are still some open questions. So what do we still want to know? The first thing is how to include gravity in our theory. So the standard model 
um, includes the electromagnetic force, the strong force, and the weak force, uh, which are three of the four fundamental forces. Uh, but gravity is not included in the standard model. Um, and it's actually very difficult to include it. Uh, it basically creates some mathematical problems. So this is really a big uh, question that uh, researchers are trying to, uh, to figure out. The second is how to explain dark matter. So from um, astrophysics observations, we know that there is a type of matter in the universe um, that we don't know about. Uh, it's called dark matter, and uh, we know nothing about it except that it has mass. And so we would like to include it in our model of fundamental particles, but for now we don't know how to. Um, we also would like to know why there is an asymmetry in matter and antimatter. Um, so at the early, very early universe, there must have been um, just a small amount of matter, uh, more than antimatter, for us all to exist now. Um, but the standard model doesn't really predict that. So that's another big question. Um, and then finally, we would like to understand why particle masses vary so widely. So each fundamental particle has um, a particular mass. Uh, but if we compare the mass of, uh, for example, the up quark with the top quark, it's several orders of magnitude. Um, so this is also a big question that we're trying to answer with our research. Next, we have Alejandra Serini. Hi, my name is Alejandra. Uh, I'm a PhD student here in the Population Health Sciences Department. And today I'm going to be talking about measuring God, a critique of validosity measurements, specifically in health sciences and public health. I want to start with a quick thought exercise. If I put up these two pictures, can we draw any associations between the two? Can we say, anything of similarity. It might be shocking, I know, but go with me for a second. These two pictures showcase a very interesting perspective of American religiosity in certain ways. And the problem is, is that the way that we measure religiosity, essentially how religious someone is, is the same across the board, regardless of how different these two pictures are. In public health, in social science, in, in um, health sciences, we understand that there are social identities that interact with health outcomes. Things like age, gender, education level, ability, uh, able-bodiedness, um, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status. We know these um, identities can impact, influence, be associated with um, you know, birth rates, uh, death rates, incarceration rates, um, poverty rates, things like that. One of the things that is often understudied is religiosity, or again, how religious a person is. The problem with this, um, there are hundreds of religiosity scales. I've put up just five on the board right now. But the problem with them is that the way that religiosity scales are created as of right now, they ask simple questions like, how often do you pray? Or how often do you go to church? Do you believe in a higher power? But if these are the questions that are being asked, then I could say maybe in an extreme way, but I could say that perhaps people in both of these pictures could score the same in a religiosity scale. And then we're creating associations between a very big, broad, and not the same type of people and having very similar associations be drawn to them. So there is a little bit of research that exists within the intersection of public health and religion, the intersection that I am focusing in during my PhD. A couple of them, again, here on the screen, and you can Google religion and public health and find many research articles that come up. But we have found, researchers have found association between how religious someone is and their willingness to get cancer screenings, their willingness to get vaccinated, their sexual health practices, and many other health behaviors and health beliefs. However, you know, we can continue having these conversations between vaccine screenings, abstinence, abortion, substance abuse and, uh, uh, use and abuse, and it really boils down to this idea that religion is a social determinant of public health. But then the question that I ask is how can we understand the impact of something if we don't measure it well? 
I want to believe as a researcher and as someone who is devoting her life to this type of work that religion is a social determinant of public health. But we don't have very good measurement tools right now to really get into the nitty gritty, into the qualitative components of religiosity to get into understanding how one type of religiosity is not the same as another type of religiosity. So again, I go back to this picture. I think about, you know, how can we improve the way that we measure religiosity? How can we improve the ways that we pick apart the way that perhaps these two pictures represent Christianity in America to some extent, but their outcomes are vastly different. I think that's one of the reasons that I love studying what I do. And I know we all think that we're studying the coolest thing ever, but I really do think I'm studying a really cool thing because religion is one of those few characteristics that are, are both protective and risk factors. I mean, think about it. If you smoke tobacco, it's usually a, a pretty solid, um, or it's a known thing that it's a negative thing to your health. And if you work out and eat your veggies, unfortunately, it's known thing, thing that is really good for your health, right? Religion is one of those things that are a little bit of both depending on how it's manifested, right? Potentially a risk factor, potentially a protective factor. Yeah, the way you measure it, again, it's all thrown into one religiosity measurement tool that makes it really hard for people like me and other researchers to make differentiations between the two. So what do we do with this, right? I have two recommendations. We'll pretend like that's the two, but two recommendations. I think the first recommendation is that we need to acknowledge the way that racism, prejudice, homophobia, transphobia, um, xenophobia exists within religious communities. Um, and maybe it's not as explicit as that, but there is extremism that exists within religious communities, specifically within Christian communities in the United States. So exploring these extreme, uh, extreme perspectives of religiosity and understanding its phenomenon is really vital and important for improving the way that we measure these things. That means more interviews, more qualitative interviews with Christian nationalists, more qualitative interviews with people who are at these polarities to understand how do they make um, how do they make sense of their religion and how can we understand the health outcomes that come from that. The second re recommendation and thing that I'm hoping to explore is creating better and more accurate measurement tools to really understand the specifics of religiosity depending on the context. So creating a measurement tool specific for the community that we're working with. Perhaps one day we will have science that allows us to have measurement tools that we can use across a variety of spectrums. But for right now, I want to believe that we shouldn't be using the same measurement tool in a predominantly white community with a very specific conservative viewpoint of religion and then bringing it over to certain communities of Latinos and Black communities and indigenous, indigenous communities and pretending like the measurement tools will accurately represent across the board. So I threw a lot of things at you. I've been studying this for years and I tried to condense it down into five minutes, but I would love to take maybe a question or two. If we have a moment. Before you do that, Alice Kinder is graduate school and for the sake of our audience on Zoom, would you run some questions? It's a little bit, I'm asking a lot of you, but if you would encapsulate it or summarize it for the audience on Zoom. Oh, okay, gotcha, thank yes. you. Yeah, uh, so do you think that consider the factor of education uh, in your study, like the people that you study, how educated they were, right? and then they, those beliefs among them, like not reading in black schools and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, education is a social identity just like any other, and so it can be something that is confounded with any type of analytical study. Um, I think if we're trying to find um, similarities between religiosity and something else, I personally gravitate towards political affiliation. I think that there's a lot of like um, tetheredness between political affiliation, religiosity, and then some type of health outcome. So education actually plays into that as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah.
Yeah, I think the example that comes to mind is how in the second part of the pandemic, um, obviously in the beginning of the pandemic, we knew that um, Black and Brown communities were the ones that were being impacted most by um, deaths and um, negative health outcomes of COVID. And then we had this shift once the vaccines were kind of accessible and readily available, where it was actually white communities that were dying more. And a lot of that had to do with um, misinformation, political affiliation, and their belief in religiosity. And so it turned from it being like a disparity of black and brown communities not having access to uh, vaccines and having um, like higher risk experiences. And then, you know, religion and politics, um, the barriers of people wanting to get vaccinated, it shifted to that community, the white community um, being impacted more by uh, vaccines. And so that's one of many examples where there is a little bit of that, like multiple identities being at play and religiosity is just another way to kind of get more in the least of it. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for your time. Up next, we have Amanda Agarwal. Very good evening, everyone. Um, today, I uh, will be presenting something that I've been mulling over in the past one, one and a half year of being here at Duke. It's actually um, an encapsulation of my own personal journey, my musings. Um, and this is a theoretical model, uh, which I hope to convert to an empirical one in future. Um, this sticky note that you see here is actually something that I wrote. It still sits on my wall. Uh, a couple of months back. Um, I This basically means that as an individual, I try to be the best version of myself and I choose actions that I hope will be, uh, will make me the best version of myself. Um, my particular paper is in context of career outcomes and the actions that I take um, in order to be the best at whatever career path that I choose. So this entire model that I will be talking about is conditional on career paths. Um, and I will be talking about the first generation conundrum, a model of wage levels as determined by information endowment. By information endowment, I basically mean the access to information that all of us have, um, our information sets. And uh, I'm referring to the relevant information for a given career, which I refer to as the gold node uh, in my paper. This is a brief of um, the entire flow or the line of thought. I think the text is a little small, so I'll just read out. The first thing says information set, uh, which is determined by social distance. Social distance in my paper is defined as um, deviation of the child's uh, career from familial networks or parental networks. So think of it like, um, someone who was born in a family of doctors and wants to be a doctor. As they grow up, they're born with, uh, they have access to mentorship and career opportunities in a way that someone who's born in a family that does not have access to that kind of network will have. Now, let's say someone who's born in a family of doctors wants to be a pilot. So they're a first generation pilot. And uh, the premise of this model is even if one has is of the same ability and has all the money in the world, if you don't have the information that is relevant to what you want to do, there will be a difference in um, the wage outcomes potentially because the time that you spend to acquire information towards becoming a pilot will be more than someone who's, let's say, born in a family of pilots and wants to become a pilot. Um, the third uh, bubble here is actions. We act upon the information that we have and we attempt to optimize or maximize our returns. Um, over here being measured by personal potential, 
which determines the value that we add to work whenever we are working. And our compensation depends on compensation of wages depends on the value added. Um, and as we try to maximize wages in every time period across our life, uh, and returns, financial returns compound over time, it is quite possible that because of a gap in the information networks, returns to wages um, may or may not converge among those individuals who have access to a certain set of information and among those who have decided to pursue a career path which is different from what they have seen growing up. Um, and just to elaborate, this uh, background is the goal node that you see, I've just tried to represent a network of information where each of these nodes represent units of information and moving from one node to another is basically me or the individual trying to acquire more information, which is what I classify as node. Uh, you're traversing across the graph. This is a brief of how I like to think about the information space uh, where you can think of it like things that I know and the set of things that I don't know. And there is a small intersection between them, uh, which I refer to are as the things that you know that you don't know. And that is represented in the X, Y plane. If you think of this network, um, we're always optimizing based on the things that you know. It will include a part of what you don't know and what you know you know. But we don't know what we don't know. So we could be at any level of this plane. And if you want to become, let's say this is the goal node for being um, a doctor and you are, you have access to the all the information that is needed to be, a, to be successful on the career path of being a doctor, you are within this network. But let's say you're born in a family that does not have access to that information or it doesn't just have to be a family uh, familiar network. It can also be access that you have through extended networks or universities or educational institutions that you've had access to. So this would be here. So in going from if this individual who is in this particular network does not have access to the information that's relevant to being a doctor, they'll probably be at the plane here. So unless they know everything that is relevant to being uh, a doctor, they will not be able to come to the plane where uh, this is the gap. This is what I define as social distance uh, between what is relevant and uh, and I don't know and what is not relevant to me. Um, moving forward, the key takeaway from this particular paper is that um, social distance determines lifetime wage outcomes through access to information networks. And this is how the information space can be imagined. Um, first generation is defined as those with a high distance and um, information space determines the way we uh, imagine wage outcomes. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but the key takeaway and the relevance of this paper is that there is merit to interventions um, that facilitate information arbitrage in high performance teams, in university settings, uh, and gaps in, uh, for instance, let's say someone has pursued a PhD immediately after their undergrad versus someone has pursued a PhD after doing an undergrad, getting some work experience, possibly diverged through different fields. So this is not just reflective. Uh, it is not necessarily reflective of a difference in ability, but it could be reflective of purely difference in information networks. And uh, the returns to acquisition of information are nonlinear because learning is an iterative process. We've all heard of the phrase steep learning curve. The idea is that when you spend more time acquiring certain information initially, your returns are lower, you acquire lesser. And then as you spend more time um, moving in that direction, you begin to understand more. When I wrote this paper, for instance, in the initial few months that I spent trying to think about this, I hardly had any output. And then as uh, I moved closer to giving this more structure, things manifested more quickly. So that is what I mean by learning being an iterative process and um, returns being nonlinear. 
this particular graph here uh, is basically classifying individuals of two kinds. One is those who those who are uh, closer to their familial networks, which is uh, type one, and this is the time it takes to get to the level of information that they need to be at a particular career. And this is the second type of individual where they take more time to reach the amount of information that is relevant for the particular career that they're targeting. And this determines a difference in the wage outcomes and the growth of wages is non-linear. Um, I hope to find empirical, I, I hope to find the same patterns if I, uh, when I convert this to an empirical model. So I would love to hear your thoughts on uh, how I can improve this particular model, what other extensions can be explored. This is the very first research paper that I've written. Very excited about it. Uh, and uh, so I think that's pretty much it. One key distinguishing factor, like why does it take more time uh, when we're looking at bridging information gaps is because cost of information acquisition can be thought of in two ways. One is you pay in time. And the second aspect is psychic cost, which is the feeling of how far um, a goal node saves. So these two aspects make a difference to the rate at which we act upon uh, something. And when we have lesser resources, lack of money, lack of mind space, or even if we have money and we have a lack of mind space, we end up taking suboptimal decisions. And uh, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but this is actually covered in this book called Scarcity, which is a wonderful read uh, and also contributed to the way I thought about this. Um, I am happy to take any questions about this. And uh, I think that, that that's it for now. I'm still working on it. Thank you so much. Don't actually have time for questions on this one, unfortunately, but we will, we will have some opportunity to chat if there are questions. Uh, next, we have Rukumani. This can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, let's see. Okay, everyone hear me? It's fine, I love this. <laughs> um, um, hi everyone, my name is Rukmani. I'm a PhD student in the literature department. And today um, I'm here to sort of explore the ideas and linkages between like border technology as well as um, colonialism and that sort of idea. And the intent of this talk is to sort of complicate and politicize the ideas that we have about the border, as well as when we consider like who belongs here, what does it mean to be a citizen? And this will be done through a sort of basic historical framing. So to begin with, we have, how do we come to understand concepts of safety, border, and legality in the United States? And how are these concepts historicized? So I don't really got that much time. So I just want to point to like a couple of like key historical events that I want to point to. Um, the first is with respect to indigenous folks um, within the United States. So for those of you who don't know, in 1930, there was the Indian Removal Act, which basically forcibly displaced and deported Indians onto the um, Trail of Tears where over like 400 Cherokee members died as well as um, hundreds of other tribes during this time. And in the United States, citizenship for Native people was not granted till 1924. Um, so this already puts, so I wanted to point to this, right? Because indigenous people have been longer than white settler colonialists in the United States, right? But there's still the way that the government is structured in the United States comes from this historical understanding of, you know, like non-white people have never been historically part of government. So even if laws are maybe enacted, it's not just the temporality in which the laws are enacted, right? It's like, what is what goes beyond that? Like, what does it mean beyond the law as to who is written into this, as well as what are the words and arguments that we use within this? Um, 
Likewise, we also have Black folks in the United States where um, even if you are a free Black person, you have to have papers, right? So one, how are papers produced within this colonialist framework? As well as if you don't have papers, but you're still a free slave, you, you are no longer free, right? You have to have some sort of proof or iconography. So I wanted to contextualize this within the U.S.-Mexican border in specific. So two, likewise, similar historical events to think about is the in 1942, the US and Mexico actually had a sort of um, negotiation and deal, it's called the Braceros Program. So the Braceros Program, in essence, the US needed a lot of low wage laborers. So they allowed legally for millions of Mexican migrants to come to the United States to earn about like 30 cents per hour. So once like migrants began to come to the United, United States, there was like a lot of backlash from um, a lot of white folks, to be honest of like, you're stealing the jobs, like we need this labor back, as well as um, understanding legality as um, almost like a physical manifestation, right? Like when we think of illegal, it becomes um, contextualized to the brown body or like to a brown person. So this like physical marker of like becoming Ill illegality causes this sort of great backlash. So you might have even heard of this with Trump's rhetoric, but there was this thing um, in like 1962, I didn't put the date on there, um, called Operation Wetback. It was the second largest deportation in US history, but the craziest freaking thing about this, right, is that it was like military style. So regardless of actually if you were a citizen or not a citizen, you could get deported based off of how you look. So you actually had like thousands of Mexican migrants that were actually US citizens get deported because they would just literally round people up, put them into buses, put them into boats, put them into planes. And on top of that, they were deported into parts of Mexico where they weren't even from. Like they were just deported into like the middle of Mexico, et cetera. And so with this, here are just like some pictures of sort of understanding of like the conditions of which Mexican migrants were put in. Um, it sort of illustrates how the borderlands represent violence, but also like that borders aren't real and they're like put onto terms as to like, what what does it what does it mean in the context of like capitalism, right? So like what bodies are like allowed to be expelled, as well as like when someone is of a source of labor, aka in the Braceros program, but how these terms can shift constantly. Um, I would encourage everyone to go back and read more of the history, like just about Texas and all of these ways in the construction of Texas. But in essence, violence against people of color becomes as a means to assert white colonial dominance and reify hegemonic constructs of belongingness. So with this, my research, um, my background is actually also in computer science. I wanted to understand how the borders transcend physical boundaries and become manifested into a digital border wall. So how is this sort of enacted by ICE? And this is a phenomenal quote by Professor Goldstein, where it says, Whereas border control is a geopolitical system by which transborder movement is regulated, the biopolitical regulation of immigrants reaches beyond the specific side of the border, penetrating the interior of the nation and impacting daily life. And so what is meant by the geopolitical and the biopolitical terms here is just how the way that biology as well as like geography kind of in essence become entangled in politics, like a very reductionist understanding, but yeah. So with this, I sort of propose this idea of like deportation terror. So how does terror then go beyond the physical to become also within the digital? But an important thing to sort of understand within this is, right, it's not just deportation in a literal context, but how do these technological mechanisms police people like through a bodily praxis and shape our sort of spaces, right? So we have the E-Verify program. So even E-Verify has a contract with ICE, but it doesn't work directly with ICE. So the, the company doesn't work directly with ICE. Rather, a company would just want to like sort of understand whether or not someone is like eligible to be working. That's like basically like the, the vernacular, right? It's eligible to be working. They put in their SSN, they put in some basic questions here and there, and then E-Verify will take that information and basically determine if you're documented or undocumented. Um, even let's say you have rights. So, and then the company will be awarded certain benefits for working with E-Verify as well. So there, there's the monetary aspect of it. And then this is then sort of polices as to whether or not someone gets hired. So, right, it's like shaping the sort of spaces in that. 
Um, a lot of people know DMV databases. So just getting your license and that information is sent to ICE. So they have sort of photography and that sort of evidence onto you. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, social media. A lot of people, um, when ICE is like on the hunt for somebody, right? They'll take someone's Facebook, track them down through social media, use that information, get someone's neighborhood, get someone's information along those lines. Um, so it's not just about ISO, right? With technological surveillance, it's also understanding how we can frame these things within like major companies and major technological companies. So Palantir, a lot of people know Palantir, but this includes Amazon, Comcast, Dell, Microsoft, Google. So even companies that maybe like sort of try to, I guess, assume as goodness, right? Like they're like good people, they're good companies. It's still important to understand their sort of relationship on the structural level. So, and that what I said was deportation terror, but it's sort of understanding, right, how, because it's no longer just about the physical, how it manifests now in a psychological, emotional, physical implications that just go beyond the material. So in essence, deportation terror is always around you. It's 24 seven, right, through our surveillance system and through this sort of digital border wall. So with that, any questions? <laughs> Up next, we have Judith Mogogwa. It's okay. Uh, my name is Judith Mogogwa. Um, so today I'll be speaking to you about something that affects millions of people in the world, and that's cancer. So um, over the summer last year, we did a cancer study, a cancer stigma study in Tanzania that was focusing on finding out what cancer stigma is like and how it affects cancer patients and their families. The reason you wanted to do that was because so many studies have been done in the developed world, but none in the low resource settings. And because the cancer mortality is rising and it's a growing concern in Africa, we think that we should do studies that impact the region and uh, create interventions that are actually for the people back there. So why was this study important? So as, as it is right now, seven out of 10 cancer deaths that occur right now are from Africa. And um, sorry, they're from low and middle income countries, but that's because 51 out of 54 countries in Africa are actually considered low, low and middle income countries. And uh, projections are made that between the year 2020 and 2040, Africa will have the highest rising numbers of cancer cases and the highest number of cancer deaths. And that's why we thought the study was the important one to have. Um, so that's a stadium in Texas, and it holds to capacity 22,000 people. But just last year, um, Tanzania lost 26,000 people to cancer. And that just puts it into perspective that all the people in the stadium perished, plus 4,000 people more. Um, and 90% of the people who go to the hospital are always in stage three or stage four cancer, which as we all know, the outcomes are very poor. So we went there and interviewed 140 cancer patients at a hospital in Moshi, Tanzania, which is a very beautiful town. It's the backdrop of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. Like when you're walking around, you can see the mountain in, you know, in the background. So we asked them three questions and we wanted to know what the attitudes are towards people with cancer. The reason you are asking these questions is because cancer stigma is one of the barriers to care. So cancer stigma is the way people treat how you know, treat cancer patients upon diagnosis. And it affects how many people are willing to go to the hospital for treatment. And then we also asked them a question that wanted to find out what the consequences of cancer stigma were. And we also wanted to get ideas from the cancer patients themselves on how we could potentially reduce cancer stigma in the continent. Um, yeah, so what did we find? Yeah, so, 
some of the things the participants told us that the moment they found out that they had cancer and they told people, this, this is what they found. Um, 56 of the people said that they experienced social isolation and discrimination or neglect from their loved ones and family. And then about 37 said that they were offered support. That's a positive uh, note. And that's the number we're hoping to increase by the intervention that we're hoping to create. And then 26 people say that they were met with fear. Every time they told someone that they had cancer, the, uh, the attitude they would get from the people was that of fear. And then uh, 11 people say there was a sense of hopelessness every time they told anyone that they had cancer. Uh, so I'll tell you about this woman. Okay, that's not her picture, but you know. Um, she's 54 years old and she had breast cancer stage four. And she said that her husband left her as soon as he found out that she had cancer. So she has to support her, her family on her own. So that fuels the self stigma in the sense that now she doesn't want to talk about it anymore. She doesn't want to be seen in the hospital. She just wants to be alone. And she suffers a lot of stress because of um, her cancer diagnosis. So um, there are other beliefs that fuel cancer stigma in the, in the setting that you are in. And 78 people say that cancer is associated with death. As soon as you find out that you have cancer, they know that you're there. It doesn't matter if it's stage one or stage four, they believe that cancer, a cancer diagnosis means death. And then others uh, say that one reason for the high amount of stigma in, the, in that setting is that cancer is very expensive to treat. So when you tell someone that you have cancer, they'll stay away from you because they know you'll be asking for help. You'll need them to help you with the cost of treatment. And since they can't afford to help you, they'll stay away from you. And then uh, 21 people say that the fact that cancer is considered contagious fuels the stigma in the region. And then 14 people knew that it was treatable. And that's a positive thing that we are hoping to increase with our interventions. 13 people say that the lack of knowledge of what cancer is fuels the stigma. So in that place, we met so many people who thought that cancer was caused by witchcraft or cancer was a punishment from God for something that you did. So that level of self-blame also fuels the self-stigma that some of the patients have. Um, two people say that, you know, two people associated cancer with shame. So um, external stigma can also be seen in the fact that people do not want to talk about the disease. So it's something that's very closeted. And while HIV stigma was the one that was highly, you know, HIV stigma is what people know about, but cancer is just matching it um, right now. So this guy that you met said that he couldn't tell people because if he tells people that he has cancer, he won't get any new jobs and he needs the money. So he he will keep his news to himself and his family doesn't know. He hasn't told his wife yet. So that's the level of stigma that's in the society. Um, yeah, so I think the numbers are too small, but I can read them for you. So this captures the consequences of stigma. So most of the people say that cancer leads them to disengage from care. They do not, they do not want to be seen by anyone at the clinic. So they'll stay home. They don't, if, if you're seen at the cancer clinic, people know you have cancer. And when they know you have cancer, they stay away from you. So one way of you know, avoiding all that stigma is by disengaging from care. And then um, another consequence of cancer stigma was that people sought traditional um, or alternative treatment. And one of the reasons they gave uh, for that is that they get more privacy when they go to the herbalists. And the fact that Herbalists are actually allowed to operate in the area. They're given licenses by the government and you know, they're cheaper. So um, people go there because they get more privacy and it offers them solace from stigma. And then um, 27 people say uh, they receive diminished support and neglect. And that's why they won't tell anyone about their cancer diagnosis. And then 26 people say that the cancer diagnosis added to their stress levels. So there's also been a linkage to a cancer diagnosis and suicide rates um, in the region. So 16 people say that they experienced no stigma and they felt no effect. These are, these are the same people who also said that they got, um, I mean, these are the same people who also had a high level of education when you look at the demographic of the participants. 
And then um, only five say that they experienced a negative body image because they know people do not like people with cancer. And you know, cancer also affects the way your body looks and it takes your body through a high toll. And that was one of the consequences of stigma. So we also asked them, what can we do um, to help reduce the stigma? And most of them said that education is what is needed. People need to know that cancer is a treatable uh, disease just like any other. And they felt that the best way to get that is by getting people who had uh, recovered from cancer or in remission and have them educate the community. They also feel that patients should be given more education, their families should be educated and the communities around them so that they're able to get support when they get a cancer diagnosis. And then 42 of them said that they would like more government support and also some health system changes. So government support in the sense that they want the treatment to be uh, available, they want it to be free or subsidized, and they also want more access to care because the hospitals are very far and wide. I met a man who said that he'd spent 15 hours on the road coming to the clinic. And you know, he says that he misses some clinic appointments because there's no way he's going to be 15 hours on the road every other week. So that's something they asked of the government. And then the uh, that two of them said that they wish people could build hope and reduce the fear around cancer. And that can be done through counseling sessions. Like when someone um, has gotten a diagnosis, then they should, be, they should receive some counseling too. And as they come to the clinic for their treatment, they should receive counseling as well. Uh, so what now? We gathered all this information, we know what they want, so what can we do with it? So our next step is we're writing a policy packet to the stakeholders in Tanzania, and we're hoping that it will actually move the needle to some, effort, to some level, and they're welcoming talks with our cancer research team, and we're hoping that will do something for them. And then we're hoping to share the findings with the community. They need to know that this is what the cancer patients feel. We need to talk to the doctors to let them understand that you know, this is how the patients feel. So as you're taking care of the physical part of the cancer, you can also, you know, um, offer psychological help because there's also a bigger issue than, um, there's a bigger issue of health force. You know, there's a lot of brain drain happening in most low and, in, low and middle income countries. So, you know, it's a problem that needs to be solved. And then uh, we're also coming up with a software, or rather a mobile app, that's supposed to be a source of information for cancer patients and it's in the works and we hope it can be free and accessible to cancer patients, not just in Tanzania, but all over Africa. Um, and this is the wonderful team I was working with back in Tanzania. Thank you, any questions? Presenters are Amanda Booth and Mona Zuniak. Okay. Yeah, you should go to the end there. Hi, I'm Amanda. I'm Alyssa here. Um, and our wonderful research partner, Catherine, is off in London having her best life. So we'll be produce, uh, presenting on her behalf. And we're going to talk to you about AI for about five minutes. And we're not mentioned chat GPT. <laughs> oh. Raise your hand if you remember the game telephone. Okay, keep your hand raised if the ending message never exactly matched the beginning message. Good, those of you who did played it probably as expected. So this simple game of telephone highlights a really important message. Things get lost in translation. So today we're gonna show you at a high level how this occurs in the world of AI. 
Well, current AI discourse is a lot like the game of telephone in the sense that ineffective information flows um, often produce a lot of misunderstanding. Um, from a human level, um, the fear of, is largely based in the unknown. Um, and we are gonna move into what looking under the hood looks like. So when you look under the hood, rational questions from the public actually emerge. What information have been collected about me over a period of time to produce these large data sets? Why this decision, but also how accurate is it? Does this technology aim to replace me or just augment my work? And then fear coupled with not understanding the risks associated with AI um, leads to a lot of harm in the general public. But transparency can act as a remedy to fear surrounding AI because it creates an environment for various stakeholders to collaborate with one another and shape the direction in which this technology is evolved. And notice this definition um, doesn't say anything about a thousand page PDF that gets posted to a website. Um, transparency is about understanding intentions and actions um, for all stakeholders and making sure that all of those stakeholders can reach that information in an accessible way. So what is transparent AI look like? For public policymakers, it's their goal is harm reduction, um, to build fairness into automated decision-making systems and affirm civil rights, racial justice, and equal opportunity. Um, but how do you do that while, and create those policies while you have companies that are worried about stifling innovation um, and have to maintain standards over time that are difficult to do in a rapidly evolving space? And then this disconnect continues for us, the consumers, whether it's a loan approval, a medical decision, or even something as simple as the next YouTube video that comes in your queue. We want clear, simple language to discuss why AI is making these decisions, not necessarily code. Um, in the public policy school, we call the extraction of this key, concise information bluff, the bottom line of front. And, you know, we find that this mis translation um, produces what we call a translation gap, um, where policymakers, the, the public, and developers are just not on the same page. So instead, we call for a translation bridge, an organizational toolkit and feedback loop process for developers to utilize at every stage of the AI development cycle. Effective communication, we have found, requires effective translation because the space is just too quickly evolving and rapidly growing. And so um, policies and principles can become stagnant and not able to keep up with new developments along the way. A great example of this we found in our research is from the Defense Innovation Unit, which is housed within the Department of Defense. They recently required all of the DOD's business partners to comply with responsible AI standards. Um, and that engagement model with vendors looks like a, a back and forth conversation um, as opposed to a compliance checklist in which uh, lawyers are just in their corner making an argument for why their company is in the clear. Um, it, an interesting quote that we found from one of, uh, one of our interviewees is that we need to make sure we're not demanding legal representations when we don't need to be because people then take a very defensive posture. So our interviews with DIU employees show that while a lot of us um, in the tech policy space have discussed uh, past fail safety certifications as a way to um, assess AI risk, we actually found that AI risks are a bit too nuanced and instead requires continuous ongoing um, monitoring to understand like how this process is evolving over time. So, Instead, we learned that um, the DIU actually makes a series of questions to AI vendors at different stages of the project development cycle. So planning, development, and deployment. Um, so when working with these AI vendors, they actually can't proceed further without going through those um, questions. Um, they make calls for appropriate levels of transparency based on risk, resources, and context. Um, so their method of transparency here is actually questioning the process at each stage in order to deliver its final product. 
So to bring this back around, our, our research question really focuses on how we can empower developers and data scientists to navigate these transparency standards. And what we found is that institutional barriers that they find within their organizations are far greater than the technical barriers they, they face to create um, AI transparency. Um, and so they can start doing these things today um, in theory. So first, they should spend more time on thoughtful documentation. Uh, we were surprised to find that there are actually many templates from the government and company that spell out exactly what to do in order to be effective with time, stewardship, and resources. Um, second, we need to bring in a wider range of various stakeholders. Okay, sorry. Second, we need to bring in a wider range of various stakeholders um, to help translate this information. Uh, so that way we can all be on the same page and essentially singing from the same sheet of music. Um, our findings also suggested that product designers are especially well suited to, do, to deal with this based off of their um, prerequisite translation skills. And then lastly, more time in the workday should be spent on bridging this translation gap, but organizational leaders actually need to adequately structure this in the work um, cycle for developers because you run the risk of burnout and putting the pressures on them. And so could it be that AI will force humans to master the art of communication? We hope so. Uh, thank you and come talk to us about our research afterwards. Finally, we have our keynote speaker, Dr. Nicole Moy. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing the 2023 Gratis keynote speaker, Dr. Nicole Moy, the James B. Duke Professor of Literature and Romance Studies and Professor of English, Philosophy, and Theater Studies at Duke University. Dr. Moy completed her PhD in Comparative Literature at the University of Virgin Norway. She worked as a college lecturer. Dr. Moy spent time in Cambridge and Oxford and at the University of Bergen before joining the Duke faculty in 1989. Dr. Moy serves as the director of the Center for Philosophy, Arts, and Literature from 2009 to 2022. Nowadays, Dr. Moy's work, Dr. Moy works primarily in the field of philosophy and literature, feminist theory, and comparative literature, with an emphasis on French and Scandinavian literature. Among her many books are Simone de Beauvoir, The Making of an Intellectual Woman, What is a Woman, and Henrik Eichsen in the Birth of Modernism, Art, Theater, and Philosophy. Her latest major book is Revolution of the Ordinary, Literary Studies after Wittgenstein, Austin, and Cavill, and Simone de Beauvoir. She thinks academics should cultivate the craft of writing both in academic and non-academic publications. She enjoys writing for general audiences and spent many years writing for newspapers in Norway. In recent years, she has written for Public Books, The Point, and the London Review of Books. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Toro Moy. So, uh, I am so mindful of the time. I'm sure the buffet is, uh, can you all hear me from this one? Okay. I'm sure the buffet is way more attractive than the talk in the humanities, but I'm starting my timer. I was given 20 minutes, and unlike our great sort of TED Talk presenters who can do this without the manuscript, I'm not even trying. I'm in the humanities. We believe in paper. Right? <laughs> so I'll just go with that. Um, okay, where's the... Um, Right. You can also use the arrow keys on the keyboard. Oh, I can do that too. Well, I have options. So my paper is called The Question of the New, or Can Academics Ever Change Their Mind? And I must say, I'm so honored to be invited to be the faculty speaker this for this year's Grad X Talks. 
I am in awe of the communication skills and the pretty PowerPoints and all that, um, which I'm probably too old ever to master fully. Um, graduate student speakers for this event were asked to, as I read it, share a defining question that they are driven to investigate further. So it seemed only appropriate that I tried to do the same thing. So this is about the work I'm struggling with now in between teaching and so on. The challenge for me as for them is to try to convey why my topic is interesting, why anyone would spend years trying to find answers and to do it in ways that can appeal across the discipline. But I have to say, uh, I am very mindful that I speak as someone deep into the humanities in this audience. Um, so, let's see. why the new then? I'm going to tell you something about how the question emerged for me, because our sort of working title is just the question of the new, so what on earth is that? So the most difficult thing in research, I think, is to find the right question. I do speak as a humanist, but I suspect something similar may be the case in the sciences, because we often begin by being interested in a certain archive or a certain subject matter, um, yet a good dissertation or a good book doesn't emerge from just having a fantastically interesting area. You, you can't just pile in your sources. You need to, to write a good um, piece of work. You need to figure out what the good questions are. And to find the questions is really hard. It is really the hardest bit. So this is, I'm always struggling with that. So if someone asks me, what am I working on now? I usually just say the new, but the new is a very vague concept. How could I find myself so fascinated by it? And what can I find out by studying the new? So in my own work then, the question began to form in three different ways of really four. First, it emerged from my own work in literary history. I did write a book on the great Norwegian dramatist, Henrik Ibsen, uh, who revolutionized modern theater in the late 19th century. He, he, his, he, what he did to modern theater was totally stunning. <clears throat> he went in with romantic tragedies and came out again with Heather Gabler, the next step being for Benjamin Beckett, and so on. Now, how did he do it? When did his audiences begin to understand that what he was doing was not just some horrible failure to implement the old standards, something genuinely new. My archive taught me that it really can be difficult to detect the emergence of the new in literary history, and that for contemporary audiences, it can be almost impossible. So then we have a very interesting question. When do we see the new, and when do we start naming it as new? That usually comes a generation later, actually. Second version of the question began, of, about the new emerged from my work in philosophy and literary theory. In the mid 1990s, I began to read the philosophy of Ludwig Wittgenstein, J.L. Austin, and Stanley Cavell. Now, this is the tradition known as ordinary language philosophy in its modern incarnation. Now, I came to this philosophy after quite a few years steeped in what we can loosely call post structuralist or post modern theory. And what happened to me was that I almost immediately experienced what I can only call a clash of paradigms. Now that, this isn't a matter of straightforward opposition as if one way of thinking argues X and the other one argues not X. Then you're not clashing paradigms, you just disagree. Um, no, it was a total reconfiguration of my theoretical and philosophical world so that now even the same claims look different. Eventually, I wrote a whole book about that just to get it off my chest. And this is Revolution of the Ordinary. I learned from all this that what was a genuine revolution for me turned out to be invisible to others. Often, and particularly in the early years of my work, I was told that I had simply failed to understand post-structuralist theory, 
So we're back to Ibsen. He just wrote a failed romantic tragedy, not, nothing new, really. Um, or in other words, what I took to be new was seen by others as simply a failure to correctly implement the old. Again, I was confronted with the question of how we come to see the new. I and a number of other people too actually felt that ordinary language philosophy really did offer something close to a new paradigm for understanding language and theory. But clearly, many of my colleagues, esteemed colleagues at Duke even, saw no such thing. And this question couldn't be settled by rational argument, for it, it appeared that adherents of the old paradigm truly didn't seem to see what we saw. As Thomas Kuhn says, adherents of different paradigm practice their trade in different worlds. When seen through a completely different paradigm, the same looks different. So that adds a, another question, namely, what does it take for academics to change their mind? Think about that. Will you ever change your minds about anything fundamental to your, to your research? I obviously realized, uh, what I did begin to realize is that I obviously did change my mind profoundly, but I also realized that I don't actually understand wh why or how. How did I do it? Many others have read the same sources as me and not done it. So the third starting point for my interest in the new came from a completely different source. I have long been interested in the relatively recent literary form that loosely goes under the name of autofiction. Um, the recent Nobel Prize winner Annie Arnaud has been writing it since the 1970s. A new distinctive wave of such work came in the early 2000s, spearheaded by the Norwegian Carlo Wittnauskos massive six volume work, My Struggle. For all kinds of reasons, which I will not bore you with here, I am actually convinced that Knausgaard's work and that of relevant other writers, such as the Canadian Sheila Hetty, the British Rachel Karsky, and so on, represent something new in literary history. But many critics can't see it. They see Knausgaard, for example, as sloppy writing. He's failed to master the correct form of metaphor, one critic wrote. Uh, or just the case of plain old memoir writing. What's all autofiction? It's supposed to be his life totally true. Why isn't it just a memoir? Why, what's the difference here? Um, so how do we detect the new in our own time? After all, when one writes history, which I'm very interested in, in the form of cultural or literary history, we always historicize in hindsight. You look back and see, oh, the French Revolution and so on. Um, but what kind of hindsight can we <clears throat> pretend to have in our own cultural moment? How, to, how do we write the history of the contemporary? Now, even after all this, I still didn't think about writing or having a project about the new. But finally, just a couple of years ago, or maybe more, I'm afraid, I sat down one sabbatical semester to work through Ludwig Wittgenstein's famous chapter on aspect seeing in what we used to call part two of philosophical investigations. Now, the only reason I did this was that I felt I had never really understood it properly. And since I regularly teach part one, I thought that it was high time to get more deeply into part two. And also, I like reading Wittgenstein. So even so, and there I found something which even I think everyone knows, even if you're not deep into literature and philosophy, because I'm pretty sure you know this figure. Now uh, this is the famous duck rabbit. Look at it one way and you see a duck. Look at it another way and you see a rabbit. Please note that this is only one example, although the most famous one of Wittgenstein's many examples of aspect seeing, and it comes from Gestalt psychology. It is not like Wittgenstein invented it. Um, please don't, so it's not at all all he has to say about it, but it's such a good picture, we have to have it. Um, as I was working my way through Wittgenstein's text, it suddenly dawned on me. And this thing that aspects dawn uh, is very crucial 
for aspect C. You have this moment where you suddenly think, aha. Oh. And one minute moment, it suddenly dawned on me that as I was laboring to understand what Wittgenstein was saying, I actually realized that what we normally call his discussion of aspect seeing or um, aspect perception is in fact the discussion of how we come to have new insights. He's actually giving us what I would call a phenomenology of seeing the new. Just what happens when something new finally clicks for us. So I began to write the paper on that. And then finally, I realized that I was properly working on it. So then quickly, and I can't under, I, why should we then talk about the new at all? Why does the new matter? Now, I've explained the background. So you already understand quite a bit about why I'm interested in it. For example, why is it so invisible for so long and so on? And my interests are clear, literary and cultural history, philosophy, theory, and so on. But why should other people, even in those fields, care about you? Well, I should point out here as an aside that academics are obsessed by the new because that is what we trade in. No one goes around saying, oh, I'm just going to say something people have said for years. But that's like not how the whole academia works, right? So we should have some interest in it, just like what is it we're doing when we claim to say something new? Um, for historians, the reason why we should care is, of course, obvious. Without some kind of concept of newness, we can't actually do history because the concept of the new is a not just connected to the concept of the old, but it has, as in Wittgenstein's terms, grammatical connections to a whole network of other terms, beginnings, endings, before, after, change, break, transition, transformation, and revolution. There's no need either to be a historian to care about the new. Existentially and politically, the idea of the new is connected to hope and, I'm afraid, to despair. If we genuinely believe that nothing is ever new under the sun, what would sustain us in our struggle to change the world? The concept of the new posits a before and conjures up a vision of an after. Without the idea of the new, works like transformation or revolution become meaningless. So there is a more. But underneath these questions, there's another one, one that has weighed on me for years, ever since I thought I had found a paradigm shift that few other people saw. But I haven't given up hope. It's coming along, in my opinion. Um, what the question is, what does it take for someone? let's say academics, to change their mind about something fundamental in their field, something we take so much for granted that it takes some work to actually notice it. Thomas Kuhn, who invented the modern understanding of paradigm, which I won't go into here, but it, yeah, if I go into it here, we'll never get out of it. He famously thought that it was almost impossible to convince adherents of the old paradigm to transfer their allegiances to the new. In the sciences, it, he says rather offhandedly, well, you get new young people picking it up. Some older people pick it up because it solves a problem exactly in their field. But most of the uh, older generation simply can't see it. They cannot see what there is to love in this new um, Copernican universe or whatever. So the new paradigm only really becomes dominant, Kuhn notes, once the adherent, adherents of the old have died. Just wait until they're all dead and you'll emerge victorious. The only problem is you're probably dead yourself too. So in the 18th century, many adherents of phlogiston, which was a matter conjured up to explain how anything could burn, <laughs> but it, they thought there had to be something called phlogiston. Then over some 30 years, they come up with a newfangled theory of oxygen, which did turn out to get, have a future, but uh, the, many people just never switched. They couldn't see it. 
So does it follow, and, and Thomas Kuhn says very clearly, paradigm shifts in our heads are not just a matter of just reading the proof. It's not just a matter of following the arguments. The Ptolemaeans read Copernicus and were unconvinced, right? So what does it take then if carefully presented evidence doesn't necessarily change people's mind, even within academia, which is supposed to be a haven for, um, for serious thinking and uh, this passionate evaluation of the evidence and so on. So if a does it mean that if a disagreement turns on fundamental paradigmatic differences, then we will never be able to see what the other sees when we look at the same thing. Now, if that's the case, what hope is there for profound disagreements of politi about politics and religion? Um, it's horrible to think about. So um, then I'm going to just, I have three and a half more minutes, so I'll do one more step. Um, ah, yes. Uh, I forgot to share with you, I forgot to share with you this share. So the, what I wanted to say here, as um, I said, we wait for the older generation to die. Um, at least don't go out and murder them, that, that's taking it too far. But Kuhn says the transfer of allegiance from a paradigm to another paradigm is a conversion experience that can't be forced. That means that and this is true. It's like the good old duck rabbit. You don't see the rabbit until you see it. And of course, people tell you it's there, but there are many of those illusions. Um, I'll show you, hang on, this one. Um, the, the, many of these illusions, you know the other thing is in there and you can't, can't will your brain to see it until it suddenly clicks. So I am not going. Um, so all I want to say before I end this is really, um, if you're going to discuss the new, you will actually also have to read up on existing theories and histories of the new. And there I have discovered that there's actually two lines of thinking out there, namely, some scholars write as if the new, about the new were a thing. Like, therefore, you should expect a theory of it. I come up with my new concept. A theory is essentially a concept which you define and work on so that all the cases of the new would fall under it. But that cannot possibly be the case since the new is obviously not a thing. Since what's new about Henry Ibsen isn't what's new about planets or whatever. How could you ever have a theory about all that? So, the interesting thing that follows for me is that the new is a relational concept. I mean that it's one that will always depend on the people who see it. You can see that in my story about people seeing it or not seeing it. Someone has to assess the new against the background of the old. Even the discovery of a new planet is relational in this sense. It's only on the background of the old stellar maps that you can say, oh, this one is new. Otherwise you have no clue. So um, this means that there's no point in trying to develop a theory of the new. I would say what, what it also means is that to use some grand words, the question of the new is phenomenological it's not ontological. It's not about defining what is, it's about defining our experience, getting clear on experiences of the new. So then of course, the next question is simply, how do we then go about doing that? And that's where I found the aspect seeing in Wittgenstein so useful, um, which of course I won't bore you, with going over Wittgenstein. Not that it's boring, it's fascinating and you should all take a crash course in Wittgenstein immediately. But for some reason, I don't think you'll got the right to you know, sign up for it right now. So I won't do it to you, but here you have some keywords. 
And then I just want to say to round off the talk. Um, yeah, it's one thing that's not on this list, and that is to see an aspect, it's always a kind of temporal experience. It dawns on you and it can fade on you. You grasp it. You can have that idea when you work that experience when you work on some stuff in research, like you suddenly feel you glimpsed it, but then it's gone, and then it takes you five months to find it again, and then and so on. Um, so all I want to say to round off, see, I did this to figure out, depended a little on how long this would be taken. So all I think I'll do, I'm going to find my end here, is to tell you how I'm thinking about this book right now. Because, oh, yeah, this one, this is, a, yeah, I want to share with you this quote. This is the question that I dwelt on. How do we ever change anyone's mind? How do we change our own mind? Um, Wittgenstein says in the investigations, once I have exhausted the justifications, I have reached bedrock. You know, you dig down, you have your spade, you're digging, and suddenly you hit rock. And at that moment, my spade is turned, he says. He means bent. It's uh, then I'm inclined to say, this is simply what I do. So after you've exhausted all the justifications, not before, you, you will try with argument and reason. But in the end, what are you going to do? Say, oh, I didn't mean it. If you're Copernicus, you can't say that. So you just say, this is what I do. This is what I see. And if we are in different paradigms, you know, or oh, if I claim this is me and you don't see it, then you simply no longer see what I see, even when we look at the same um, features. And this is the Thomas Kuhn thing. And what I'm thinking of doing now is simply, simply, this always changes the but I've written quite a bit of something that is an introduction. I have worked out Wittgenstein on aspect seeing, and I've written rather a lot on Kuhn, and I might add something on Cavell because he writes about the emergence of, of about modernism, which would be a theme. So then I might have a chapter on the 19th century, that would be Ibsen, but it wouldn't be much about Ibsen. It would be how do we detect the first signs of modernism in an age when no one knows that modernism would be a thing 80 years later. Secondly, um, autofiction. And then maybe a question of what is going on when academics in my field will quarrel violently over the field? Are they paradigm battles? Or are they just disagreements? And with that, it's over. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and for listening to all of our wonderful talks. Gavin is opening the food. So we hope that you'll stay and enjoy uh, some food with us and chat with our presenters. And uh, it's been a great time.